Well, first of all, thank you for having me. Great honor. And I want to talk to you today about big data. Uh, when we hear that word, you know, a lot of us uh, think about privacy-related issues, and you know, it's gotten a lot of bad press lately. You know? So let's talk about how big data and technology in general is actually making us more human. So first of all, what is big data? Buzzword, you know, what are characteristics of big data? It's big. <laughs> kind of profound truth you come up with after two uh, master's degree and one graduate certificate. But jokes aside, we can't even fathom, and it's mind-boggling how much data is there. Uh, not humanly manageable, uh, not by a single person, not by a team, not even by a single nation. Uh, so we definitely need technology to assist us there. Uh, another characteristic is that it's extremely diverse, a uh, variety of, of data now. Back in the days when people were looking at uh, multi-relational databases, you know, there was a question, is it a, a char, a var char? So we were thinking in terms of text. Now we're thinking in terms of images, videos, sound file, and so on and so forth. It's extremely diverse. Third characteristic is that it's exponentially increasing. Uh, as I'm talking, it's probably uh, some trillion of uh, zeros and ones of data that are being generated right now. How is it created? So traditional model, we've got businesses, uh, we've an army of data entry uh, folks out there entering the customer's data. Now we're moving more and more towards users generating the data themselves, about themselves. Either actively, let's say you create a uh, social media profile, or passively, not even knowing that you're creating big data when you're interacting on the web or uh, using other platforms. What kind of data do we leave behind us? Age, gender, interest, location, income, and you might wonder for some of you, you know, well, how do we leave all that? Is that on purpose? Well, again, it's passively and actively. Uh, location, first thing that comes to mind would be your IP address. Uh, so typically associated with a specific, uh, specific geolocation coordinates. Uh, but then we, we can also think about this from a human standpoint. You know, there are humans out there who interpret big data and make inferences. Example, uh, I don't know if you've heard of something called Vegemite. Big in Australia, uh, it's basically uh, made with leftover beer yeast. Uh, I know it's before lunch, so make sure that giving you something appetizing to think about. <laughs> so let's say you look for a Vegemite a lot. Uh, so we're probably going to assume you're Australian or that you're in Australia. So the inferences and assumptions being made. Or we're going to assume you just have some really, really weird test buds. So one of the two. Income tier, depending on your zip code, you can correlate that with your census data and start getting a, a, a more granular picture of what kind of user you are and lots of information about you. How is it collected? Uh, well, let's start with the, the newest, the shiniest, and uh, the brightest first. IoT, uh, so we live in the edge of the Internet of Things. Uh, if you have a smart home, if you don't have a smart home, you know, doesn't mean you have a dumb home, but it, typically what we mean by smart home is that you, uh, you have a thermostat that's connected to your Wi-Fi, sending information out there so that uh, we can know more about you know, what your preferences are when you come home from work, you know, turning it back up to 72 or 71, uh, and so on and so forth. So we got a lot of, of devices, physical devices now being connected to the web, uh, sending data at, at any given time. Of course, because <clears throat> we also have smartphone apps uh, that uh, typically request permissions. Whether or not you read those, it's kind of like the terms and conditions on contracts, you know, most people skip over, but it, it's very interesting what those permissions are. Uh, they can be about interacting with other apps on your phone, therefore collecting data uh, from those apps, or uh, the most simple permission is geolocation, which in the field of digital advertising is also becoming huge. Uh, we have entire companies now that sell lists uh, to businesses about, uh, let's say you've been to a particular car dealership, your smartphone was on, geolocation was on, all of a sudden we're going to figure out, well, because you've been to that car dealership about a week ago, you're very likely to want to hear about the competitor and we're able to target ads based on where you've been 
a week or a month ago because you had your geolocation turned on, um, whether or not you did it on purpose. And again, that kind of brings us to being more cognizant and you know, taking control and being more active in our choices there. Loyalty programs, that's the old fashioned kind. You go to your favorite grocery store, scan your card. Again, lots of data being generated about uh, what kind of products do you like to buy. Uh, during the last election campaign, I started getting a lot of calls like everybody else. Uh, and, and I ask, you know, because it's a field I'm working in, you know, how, why me? Uh, so they're like, well, based on, you know, actually where you shop and, you know, those products. And I had a long conversation with one of the data scientists for that particular campaign, where it turns out that my shopping habits apparently reflect that uh, I'm of a particular political persuasion, which might or might not be true. Uh, so loyalty programs, big part. Uh, and then we've got the most obvious of all, website visits, you know, the old cookie thing. Uh, and that brings me <coughs> to my sick, my other point there, 46%, staggering number. According to a study by a company called Clutch, 2016 small business uh, survey, 46% of small businesses do not even have websites at all. So that means they're not even collecting the most basic kind of data about their user base or their customers or potential customers. How can business use big data tools? Uh, precision and relevancy. So we can target the right customer for the product, but not just the right customer, also the right customer at the right stage. There's that concept of marketing funnel where in the initial stage we've got brand awareness. Uh, people just hear about your product or your brand and they're interested, but they're not quite ready to buy. And then we get uh, intent while well, you know, thinking more and more about buying and then we've got conversion. They're ready to make the purchase, so that's the time where you want to you know, you're about to click on that window, the X out, and you get that pop-up message that says, hey, today only 30% off. That's a good time to offer that without sounding like your product is not worth anything because that person might be ready to buy. So it's targeting the right people, but also at the right time. So precision and relevancy. What are alternatives to change? Well, first one is inertia. Uh, going back to my Australian theme, take the ostrich, stick your head in the sand and say, this is not happening. I'm going to keep on doing business the same way I've been doing business and uh, keep on going straight. Uh, second alternative to change would be anger. Uh, so back in uh, 1811, uh, for about five years till 1816, the Luddites uh, were uh, wool textile workers uh, who decided that the best way to fight change was to go destroy machinery. So we had the Industrial Revolution in England. The Luddites decided, you know, we, we're going to stop change by destroying the machines. Spoiler alert, it didn't work too well. Uh, they lost. So back to inertia. There's a great quote from Sir Isaac Newton. Uh, it says that every body continues in its state of rest or uniform motion in a right line unless it is compelled to change that state by forces impressed upon it. Do we need to be forced to change? It's a question. It seems like most of the time we do. So instead of resisting change, what can we do to embrace it? Well, we can get personal. How many of you know how many hours you slept last year? Raise your hand. You got a Fitbit? I like it. Uh, not too many, though. Only one person in the audience. Uh, how many of you know uh, how many times you watched a particular show last year? I mean, there's so many things about ourselves that we don't know because typically we don't collect data about ourselves, and most of us don't. Uh, so businesses have a chance to really present you with choices that are more suited for your taste. Many times we end up with information paralysis. There's so many choices today. The problem is not lack of options. Scarcity used to be a problem back in the days. Uh, now it's not. It's quite the opposite problem is how do we make the right choices? And we need help because there are too many choices. So businesses can help you to make better choices by using big data. 
and really we can find it a lot about ourselves. Uh, I haven't used cable for a long time, so I have my favorite online streaming uh, movie company. Many times uh, I turn on and I'm like, I don't really know what I want to watch because I've been thinking all day, I've been working all day, so now is not the time where I want to spend five hours going through hundreds and hundreds of documentaries and movies, and then all of a sudden I get this, you know, you want to watch a documentary about uh, the life of ants, and I'm like, yes, I do. <laughs> they, uh, that's exactly what I wanted to do. I didn't know I wanted it, but actually, I really, I like it. So all of a sudden, my life gets a whole lot better, and I have entertainment, what qualifies as entertainment for me. Uh, the, uh, so really, big data can also help us to know ourselves better. It's not just businesses knowing about ourselves. It's really finding out more about ourselves. And if you start collecting data, uh, you know, old term is journaling, you know, and journaling with actual data about yourself, it, you'd be amazed about what you found out about who you really are. Because we never stop finding out about who we are, truly. And that's a great tool. So businesses can also treat us more like individuals instead of just faceless customers. Uh, not just knowing us by uh, our preferences, but also by you know, the, the better choices that would be more suited for us. Because in the end, really, we're afraid of change. We're afraid of technology. We're concerned about privacy. Uh, we're also afraid of being replaced and made irrelevant by technology. Uh, but I don't think technology is making us irrelevant at all as human beings. Uh, quite the opposite. Uh, I think it's making us more human because we can finally be freed uh, from and, and ins the enslavement we have of just performing the same repetitive task over and over. That's not being human. That's being a robot. And for way too long, we've been enslaved by repetitive tasks. Now we have enough options when you look at technology and big data to actually concentrate on what makes us human, that unique mix of emotion, logic, perception, and really concentrate on making sense of the data. Because uh, it's not about generating the amount that matters. It's about interpreting the data and analyzing it. And nobody's better suited than us. So we can now concentrate on that part instead of trying to enter the data, generate the data, and so on and so forth. So we really don't have to fear. Change is an opportunity to reinvent the way we do business. Technology and big data can now allow us, not just businesses, but everybody, to really get to know uh, ourselves in order to become more personal and have this relationship with each other. So change is really a chance to become more human. I'm in a school of science and math, so I couldn't resist. You know, everybody has learned about the uh, commutative property of additions that says that one plus two is the same as two plus one. Well, I want you to forget about that for a second. And when you think about change, instead of thinking about change equals beginning plus end, I want you to think about change equals end plus beginning. Thank you. <laughs>